But I am honored to be here and honored to be sharing with you and participating with you then this week um, and listening to different workshops and engaging different people at the table and grateful for the opportunity. You know, the, um, there's been a, a, an occasional reference to the rafters, that the rafters bear witness to the praise that has been happening in this building for over a hundred years, or in this place, right, since what, 1852, do I have that right, that, that this has been a place where Christians have gathered here in the Northwest to praise God. And we remember those witnesses. I, I really enjoyed having the kids up here. I worked up a sweat. It doesn't take a lot, you know. <laughs> doesn't take a lot to work up a sweat. But uh, worked up a little sweat, but I enjoyed the kids, having so many kids as a part of this week. What a beautiful thing that is. I, I enjoy kind of our, those of my age, you know, 60s and so on. I'm glad that you're here. You, you represent years of ministry and years of service and years of experience that you bring to the table so that those parents of those kids might have the benefit of that experience. But I also want to suggest that we have another witness here. That the witness of our children, the witness of our young adults, the witness of our, you know, 60s and up, is gathered with another witness. See, in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 22, it says, You have come. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the angels gathered in festive assembly, to the church, of the firstborn ones whose names are written in heaven. And you have come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to God, the judge of all, and to Jesus, and to His blood, which speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You have come. This is where we have come. When we gather, we come. This is the draw near of Hebrews 10, verse 22. This is the draw near that is coming together in assembly to stir one another up into good works and to bear witness to the faithfulness of God. We gather, we come, but we don't come just to these rafters. Though they speak a good word about the story of this place, we come to the heavenly Jerusalem. We go to church. Not church in the sense of some institution, but we gather with the assembly that is around the throne of God. We come to the saints. We come to those whose spirits, the spirits who have been made perfect. In other words, the witnesses that began the story here, whatever year that was, 1852 is in my head for some reason, whatever year it was that they started, they're still here. I don't mean they're here on the grounds. I mean, they are gathered around the throne of God. And when we gather, we gather with them. We join them. We participate with them. When we gather, it's not just who we can see that we're gathered with. We are gathered with the church all around the world that gathers in that throne room. And we gather with those who've gone before, whether it's Moses and Sarah and Abraham and Deborah, or whether it's Mary and Peter and Paul and Dorcas, whether it's, and you can name them, and you can name those who have sat in these seats over the last hundred years or more. And we still gather with them. I told this story at the Explorers Conference. At least I think I did. I, I should have. I didn't. But I'm not sure, did I? But I think I did. But when it comes to grief... I don't know what your practice is. Maybe your practice is to visit the grave. And I understand that. And if God comforts you through visiting the grave, God be praised. 
well, let's use everything God puts in our life to comfort us, right? But when I visit the grave, I don't feel comfort. That's, that's me. Doesn't have to be you. I, I don't feel comfort. My first wife died in 1980. My father died in 94. My mother died during COVID. My son died in 2001 at the age of 16. And every year I go visit his grave. I don't visit it because I feel better. In fact, I feel worse. It's a place where I grieve, it's where I lament, it's where I complain, it's where I protest, it's where I wonder why, I question, I doubt. I I lay it all out there because it seems so permanent to me. But the day on which I do that is one time a year on Easter morning. Because where I go, I go from the grave to church. And I go to church to visit my son. I go to church to be with the saints. I go to church to be with the church all around the world. I go to church to gather with the spirits of the righteous made perfect. To join the chorus of the angels and to sing with my son and with my wife and others, and you can name yours who are there as well. You see, when I go to church, this isn't just some kind of horizontal event. It isn't just a moment when I look around and say, oh, that's good to see everybody here, and that's good. Nothing wrong with that. That's important. But when I go to church, I go to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. I go to God. I go to Jesus. I go to the, I join the chorus of angels. And I join the church that's gathered there from all over the world, whether it's Singapore or Toronto or Chile or wherever it is, the church is gathered there. And I go to church, not to a building, but to an assembly. An assembly of people got over the world and I joined that assembly that sings the praise of God and I joined those who have gone before singing with Paul and Peter, singing with Joshua and Moses, singing, singing with the witnesses that built this place that are a part of these rafters. That's the church. And the church is bearing witness in the heavenlies. Bearing witness that they have run a race and they set, but they set out on that race with a promise. And they trusted in that promise and they believed that promise. And they didn't ever see the full story. They didn't ever see the full event. They didn't receive the full inheritance. But they persevered in faith. And now gathered around the throne, they are witnesses too. The joy of faith, the reality in which we believe. And they invite us to join them. And they are witnesses to faith that urge us on to persevere, to keep going. Because they, the church triumphant, is praying for the church militant. The church here. And the church here is what is described in Ephesians chapter 4. If you would stand for the reading of the Word of God, if you're able, if you're not able, that's fine too. Ephesians chapter 1, no, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 16. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with complete humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, 
one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. And each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When he says, when it says he ascended, eh, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. We must grow up in every way into Him who is the head, which is Christ, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself in love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Unity. Oneness. That language permeates this text, doesn't it? In fact, if you look at verses 4 to 6, I think that's probably a pretty familiar text for a lot of us. It's certainly an important text in the history of the Restoration Movement. Alexander Campbell called attention to this text over and over and over again because he thought these seven ones formed kind of a, a foundation, a place where all denominations could agree, where every stripe of Christian sect could agree on these seven things and that the rest was opinion and people can have their opinions if they want but and we don't have to agree with each other's opinions but we if we're going to be Christians we're going to agree on this this forms the unity and I think that's that's close to what I think Ephesians is doing here because when Paul offers these seven ones, I don't know that he's trying to be exhaustive. I don't know that he's trying to, you know, just pinpoint everything. I think he's summarizing. He's summarizing what he just said in the first three chapters. You know, as it begins with, therefore, chapter four, verse one, therefore, that, go back and look at it. You know, because of all that, because of what I said there, this is what you are called to do. You are called to live a life worthy of the calling with which you are called. And the summary of that therefore, what's at, the, what's at the grounding of that therefore, I think is these seven ones. Remember Paul said in Ephesians 3, verse 4 or so, said, I'm writing this. I, I just wrote these two chapters. He didn't call them chapters, of course. But you know, I just wrote this so that when you read you might understand or you might have an understanding of the mystery of Christ. That's why I write this letter. Maybe that's why we should read the Bible. We don't read the Bible to figure everything out. We don't read the Bible to fix everything. We read the Bible, or Paul says, read Ephesians, to understand the mystery 
of Christ. And I think those seven ones are, are, are ways of saying here is, here is the substance. Here's the reality. And it's a reality that God has achieved. It's not something we have achieved. We don't achieve the unity. God has gifted the unity through the gift of God's story among us. God makes one body. God makes the hope a hope. God bestows the Spirit. God sends the Christ, the Lord. God gives us with faith a story. A story about who Jesus is and what God has done in Christ. And God gives us with baptism. It's not about what we do. It's about what God has given. The unity is rooted in what God has done. And whenever we think that we have to achieve unity... That's when we're going to have these knock-down, drag-out debates. Because my vision of unity in its achieved form is going to be different from your vision of unity in its achieved form. What we need is a recognition of the unity that is gifted to us. Given to us. And what that substance is in terms of the story of God in Christ by the Spirit making us one body, one new human as Melissa talked about yesterday. God has saved us by grace through faith. Not of ourselves. It is not of ourselves, but it is what? The gift of God. That's verses 4 to 6 of Ephesians 4. It is the gift of God and the one God and Father of us all. Remember he started the book in chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now he says in chapter 4. The one God and Father of us all. Because we are chosen in Christ. Unity is something that God gifts us with. God achieves. God establishes. And that's why Paul says, you've got to keep this thing. You've got to maintain this unity. You've got to preserve this unity. Oh, I don't think he's saying that you have to create something on top of it. I think he's saying is, as God gathered us in this one body, we can really mess this thing up. We can undermine the work that God has done in some sense. Not that we destroy what God has said. No, that's not what I mean. What I mean is that as we come together as one body and we live in relationship and we live in real world with each other, it gets difficult. As Wes said this morning, it's like porcupines getting together to endure the storm, right? When porcupines get together under the horizon of the storm, they kind of poke each other. And that's kind of what happens with us. And so it's not, it's not too surprising that Paul says, you know, there's a unity that God has achieved for us. The mystery of Christ has accomplished this for us. We are to be, we are blessed. And God is to be blessed. We are to give thanks as we just prayed in chapter 3. We have a unity. And now it is out of that unity that we have to relate to each other and live with one another. Conflict's going to happen. I hope y'all heard some of the conflict workshops this week. They were really good. Doug and Andrew. You know, Doug made the point that we need to be more Christ-like in our conflicts. We need to do conflict like Christ. Maybe that's pictured here in Ephesians 4. What does it say? With complete humility and gentleness. Wow, that's a conflict you you would enjoy, right? Complete humility and gentleness. Bearing with one another in love. That's, you know, don't get so mad so quickly. Forbear. Stick with each other with patience. With patience. So, the process of dealing with conflict, Doug said, was 
Maybe the outcome is not the main thing, it's the process that's the main thing, where we learn to love one another. Where else are we going to grow and mature in a community if we don't connect with each other, forbear with one another, be patient with one another, and grow up? You know, I've had, I've had moments during COVID where I wanted to say to people, grow up, you know, you know. And that's the point. How do you grow up in Christ? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, forbearing one another in love to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Because that's, we are called into this body and into this body we come together. We didn't choose each other. God chose us. We didn't choose each other, but we are in it together. And so we must function with each other and love each other and care for each other and be humble toward each other and be Christ-like in the way we do conflict. Or as, or as Andrew said, you know, one of the, what, where we need our stability in conflict, our identity is very important. Who are we? Do we know who we are? If we have our identity rooted in the substance of what God has done to accomplish this unity... If we know our identity, I can put up with you. If I know my identity, then I can be like Christ and humble myself before you. If I know my identity, then I can be like God who is... It's hard to anger. Slow to anger. Can I live with you like that? Only if I know my identity. If my desires are become my demands, as Arthur talked about, if my desire, Andrew talked about, if my desires become my demands that then divide, that's not forbearing with one another. That's not humility. That's not gentleness. And it will disrupt the relationships in the body. And instead of being the one another community, that bears witness to the world that we are the disciples of Christ because we love one another. That won't happen. We'll just become divided people, angry with one another, and showing off to the world on Facebook that we don't like one another. What a witness is that? So the unity is important here. It's the unity God achieved for us. And in it, we find our our integrity, we find our grounding, we find our identity. And out of that identity, I can then learn to live with you. But it's more than that. God has not created a body just to see how we live together. See if we can get along. God has created a body to grow into the fullness of Christ. It is a growth dynamic that God is interested in. And don't hear that just in terms of numbers. I'm not just talking about numbers. I'm talking about growing deeper roots as well as growing and multiplying. Because the letter says, Paul says in verse 4, and then again in verse, what, 16 is it? He uses this word, each one. Each. It says in verse 7, each of us. Did you hear that? Each of us has been given a gift according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Each of us. And then in verse 15, 16, whichever one that is, that each part working together into the fullness of the measure of Christ. That as each part works together, there is a growth that happens because God is equipping us because the growth isn't out of our own energies. The growth is not out of our own resources. Rather, it says, from the head, Christ, from whom? Christ is the source here. 
Christ is the source that gives life to the body, that invigorates the body, that equips the body. And God in Christ is giving gifts to the body so that the body might grow, it might mature. And when it matures, it fills all things because the body of Christ fills the world. Go back to the creation story. What is God interested in? God says, I I made imagers. I made human beings who image me. And I gave them a vocation to be fruitful and multiply and what? Fill the earth. See, I don't think... I don't think that filling is just about biology. Oh, it includes it, for sure. But it's not just about biology. Because the filling is the filling of the earth with the glory of God. Because human beings who are flourishing and living out of that story and embodying the life of God in their own story, they are the glory of God. We are the glory of God. Remember Ephesians 1? That we are... To be for the praise of the glory of God. And when we are the glory of God, we fill the earth with His glory. And the church is the ongoing project that God has in mind here. That the church is the place where the glory of God resides. And as the church is the church, as the church is the body of Christ, and as it grows, and each does its part, each one of us gifted in different ways, do our part, participate in that growth. We fill the earth with the glory of God. That there's a missional community over here in Turner. There's a missional community in Eugene. There's a missional community in Portland. There's a, these missional communities are places where the glory of God resides and the glory of God bears witness to the world. We are the glory of God. And we are called to participate in that maturation of the body so that it can become the witness to the glory that will fill the earth. Each of us. See, our unity has a diversity. Some are apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. And then we know there are a lot of other kinds of gifts as well. Those are focused on here, maybe, because it's about people who are equipped to tell the story, to probe, to to dig into the story, to explore the story, and to teach the church, and to lead the church in certain ways. Not exactly sure about that. But we do know each of us has a gift. And there are more gifts than the people that are described in Ephesians 4 verse 11. Each of us has a role to play. Each of us has a part to contribute. We as the church are a participatory community. We are the priesthood. And all believers are priests in the community of God to offer sacrifices to God, sacrifices of praise, sacrifices of ministry, sacrifices of good deeds, sacrifices in both assembly and outside the assembly. Each of us. And so it's so important that as we think about the unity of the body, that we honor the diversity of its gifts. Now we don't exalt one gift over another. But we call each other to use our gifts in the body of Christ. And if you don't know what your gift is, it seems to me one of the best ways to find out is ask the people who know you best and believe them. Don't deny it. Don't say, oh, no, not really. I don't feel that way. Who knows you the best? Get, a, get, a, get an intimate group of people together, three or four people, and say, what are my gifts? What do you see in me? How do you see God working in me? Where do you see God using me? How have you experienced that in your life in terms of my relationship with you? And I, um, I can't guarantee it. But I can imagine it with the Spirit's power 
that your gifts will emerge in that discussion. And perhaps clarity will come. We are gifted people. We are gifted with the gospel, the mystery of Christ. God has gifted us with a reality in Christ by the Spirit. And we are gifted with the capacities, the opportunities, and the energy by the power of the Spirit to do, to participate in the growth and maturing of the body of Christ. And when the body of Christ becomes mature, the world will notice. As long as we're infighting, as long as we're arguing with one another, as long as we're dissing each other, angry with each other, frustrated with each other, as long as we're doing that, the world doesn't care. They just look at us and say, why would I want to be a part of that? But if we serve one another in all humility and gentleness and our responses to each other are responses rather than reactions, our response is listening rather than defensiveness, if we have patience with one another, if we are forbearing with each other in love, if we don't get upset and mad at the drop of a hat, but then we seek to maintain the unity that God has given us, that we can display that unity in our relationships with each other and recognize in each other the gifts that God has given to the body, the church will mature. And it will become a powerful witness in the world. A place where others will say, I want to get some of that. I want to be a part of that. Unity and diversity. The story of God in Christ generates the unity, creates the unity. And our story, nestled in God's story, empowered and equipped by the Spirit and by the gifts of Christ, will grow up into the full measure of the body of Christ. And God will be praised. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.